Um, good morning, everyone. Um, thank you for coming and inviting me to come talk to you about this. So, um, um, maybe a little bit about me. So I work in this company called HB uh, Lab Singapore, Hewlett Packard Labs. It was formed in uh, a couple of years ago, and you're interested. Uh, that's my uh, Twitter uh, handle, and uh, uh, yeah, for the lack of creativity, I just put my whole name in. So um, today, uh, the topic of the talk is really about distributed computing for new bloods, not necessarily old bloods or mug bloods or something like that, but really for everybody. So. Uh, so let's get started. So the first thing is you need to understand what is a distributed computing uh, system, right? Distributed computing is already here in case you didn't realize it. Okay, it's been here for literally a very long time. So and most of the time you don't realize uh, what's going on, uh, especially when it comes to um, a lot of the stuff that you see out there. For example, when you use Facebook, uh, Facebook when you send instant messaging, distributed computing is there. You normally don't worry about how messages get transported when you hit on the enter uh, key when you try to send a message across, right? So when you, for example, when you make a telephone call, right? Distributed systems are there. You see packets getting transferred over the wire, over OTA, uh, etc., and then reaches the base station and gets uh, sort of uh, uh, retransported to the recipients, and then things just magically happen, right? You normally don't worry about it, right? So, but here's the thing, right? Distributed systems are possibly the new frontier, but that's my opinion. So, uh, whether you like it or not. So, the new frontier reasoning is uh, probably because um, right now there's a lot of large scale, web scale kind of databases out there, right? So, as an example, uh, Facebook, uh, and Google are pioneering this thing called the Web SQL, which allows you to basically run queries and across the internet in that sense. Now, when you run SQL in a very local uh, sense, what you really are conducting is really something like a local query across your local database. It doesn't understand things like database federation, right? Like for example, if I were to do a select query across multiple tables, first of all, as an SQL uh, guy, you need to know where your tables are, in which databases, and stuff like this. So this web SQL is, is one of those um, um, sort of like cutting edge efforts to try to understand how to conduct web scale SQL in real time, right? Okay, so um, this real systems are already, already there, ATMs, right? When you go to an ATM, slot in your credit card, hit your PIN number, and, and, and a lot of things happens, right? So one thing is that the ATM at the back end will know that you are here and you're not trying to withdraw your money somewhere else, right? How does it know that, right? So uh, there are a lot of things inside this distributed uh, system uh, that allows you to um, sort of, first of all, understand who you are and what causes what event to happen at this particular time and whether there is a relationship between this particular event to some past event. Okay, so, so it begs the question, what really is the essence of uh, distributed systems? And uh, it is important when you think about distributed systems, uh, one of the common themes is actually designing for failure. So when something fails, which almost always happens because we're not living in a perfect world, you need to understand how to circumvent or rather, how to live with the trade-offs in a distributed system. So it brings down to the essence itself. The essence is really about two things. It's really about trying to attempt to overcome two important things, and one of them is information travel. So, uh, and second thing is when independent processes fail. So what, what this is trying to say is that when data is traveling from this particular point A to point B, it is moving at the speed of light. That's, that's really a physical uh, quality, right? So it has a fixed time that it will reach this particular destination. So when it comes to distributed computing, what you're trying to understand is also how data messages interact across different nodes, given these uh, physical limits itself. 
Now, in these physical limits, servers do fail, networks do fail, right? Distributed computing is also about trying to overcome and trying to understand what, what should happen when systems fail and when network fails. So, so this slide is very, uh, it's, it's really simple, but to me it highlights a lot of the important things. So one of the things is that, one thing that I sort of never um, sort of came, uh, sort of uh, understood pretty late into my adult years is that information actually travels at a speed of light, which is 300,000 uh, kilometers per second. And that actually defines a hard limit between um, when one message crosses from one point to another point. Now, when you, when you sort of lift this up, this abstraction up, right, what you're really talking about is sending a packet of data over the IP from one point to another point. And it is defined by this physical limit. So, now, the other thing is when independent things do not fail. So, for example, uh, in an example of, let's say, you're calling your buddy. So, when, when you call somebody, what happens is that you are you, your friend is your friend. They are not the same person, right? So when you speak something, this other person would need to understand it. So understanding is actually a, an implicit acknowledgement to your message itself. So in this case, when independent things do not fail, everything works very well, right? But when things do fail, the question is, do you know what is the thing that fails? In this case, when messages are tra traveling between X and Y, assuming that there is a network failure, the question becomes, can you tell the difference between a network failure and a no failure? Right? So this is pretty important. So one of the key things in distributed computing to understand is there really is no difference between a slow node and a dead node. You really do not know. Okay. So, now, having understood these two things, right, the next thing you want to probably want, uh, one of the questions you will pop into your head is really why do we need a distributed system? Really, particularly, I see it for two reasons. One is really about scalability. When the needs of, simply means, when the needs of a, a system outgrows what a single node can provide. And this is very real right now. Uh, simply because um, when I'm working in uh, my current uh, employer, we're building on this thing called a big data analytics platform. So what we're building, uh, what, what we're really getting here is really petabytes of data. And two of my colleagues are actually sitting over there. So, <laughs> so it's quite jittery for me. So um, now when the uh, data starts to come in, right, it basically flows from a lot of places to this particular point where it's being aggregated. Now, a lot of times what we're seeing is that data really overflows the amount of available RAM in a single node. Now, when you have situations like this, you need to think of uh, what is the failure that more you should have, right? So when data overwhelms the RAM, you have two ways. You either say, you know, okay, let's just let it fail because it has, failure condition has occurred. But is that what you really want to achieve in a real world system? Right? when people expect a uh, system to be always up, right? So that begs the question. So the next thing is that the second option to handle this sort of things is really to s sort of uh, graceful degradation, as they call it. So what they actually do is to build a distributed data structure on this particular data that's coming in, and then they keep chunks of it, they keep chunks of it in a memory, and then uses a replacement policy to flush um, for example, uh, old data out, and then so that they can put new data back in. So this is uh, pretty interesting to me. So uh, this is some of the questions that we have to tackle on a daily basis, and it relates to stuff like scalability. So the next thing is availability. So availability to me is really implicit, right? When you, I still remember three weeks ago when my uh, more, uh, teetering network actually went down on Singtel. I went blasting Singtel on the Twitter subsequently later. And uh, it was a very unpleasant experience because availability is, is kind of sort of implicit, right? It's implied. When you go on to Facebook, when you go on to Google Plus, or you go on to conducting your ATM transactions, right? The first thing you expect it is you see the physical thing over there, you expect it to be working. Right? So somehow this 
physical thing implies that availability needs to be there. And availability in distributed systems is, until today, is a very hard thing to solve. I'll come to, I'll come to that in a, in a short while later. Okay. So, um, so what I do, or, or rather what we do on a daily basis, is really trying to answer these kind of questions. Is it really that hard, right, given all these things? Can't we just achieve availability and scalability? Do we, can we really trade off? Is there a trade off, right? Can we live with the trade offs if there is one? Turns out there actually is. And um, the first thing that you need to realize is knowing what is possible and what is inherently impossible. So even widely accepted facts are now being challenged. So I'm not sure whether you guys are aware of that. Uh, HP itself acquired this piece of database technology called HP Vertica. So Vertica is one of the fastest uh, SQL, querying SQL engines on the planet, de developed by this guy called Michael Stonebreaker. So uh, he has some thoughts on how to achieve uh, availability and scalability without any trade-offs. I'll, I'll come to that subsequently later. But what this, what this slide is trying to tell you is that a lot of the distributed computing stuff where we sort of established in the 1980s is being broken broken over time in the last uh, 20 years or so uh, by better, uh, better hardware, actually. So, okay. Right. So, now, all this is, sounds a bit abstract. So, uh, let's come back to something probably more uh, fundamental. Um, so, in 1994, Peter Deutsch, uh, that was when Sun Microsystems was still around, Peter Deutsch and a bunch of other fellows conjecture the eight fallacies of distributed computing. So one of them is the first one, um, in no particular order, is that the network is reliable. Now we all know the network is not reliable, right? So, sorry. So the network is unreliable because network do fail, right? Um, when I still remember when I first started out as an engineer, I was running in uh, running systems management in the data centers along Chai Chi Road. I'm not sure whether you're aware of that, but that's where the government data centers all are, and you have hundreds and hundreds of ranks deployed at different times, right? At different times also means that different um, NIC versions, different stuff, and then things were failing all over the place. And then we wonder, and the management points to the uh, data management guys like, you suck. You literally suck. And the guys were like, you monkeys, you have no idea what, what is so complicated over here. And one of the things is, uh, of course, one of the things is actually um, network to, uh, at the time was really something new, uh, at least in that data center. So obviously it has some issues with more, but the, the, the crux of the thing is that a lot of different hardware vendors come in with their proprietary protocols. Proprietary protocols has an impact on the network, uh, especially on the usage and, all, uh, and the maintenance wise. But that's part one of the problem. Part two of the problem, which is the real problem, is you do not understand the workload that is going around, going around in your network. Uh, and uh, recently, in July of this year, uh, this guy, Dr. Eric Brewer, actually called upon in ACM for guys to start releasing uh, network failure data. And he personally approached uh, Google, Facebook, and uh, the big guys to start releasing this sort of data to, to try to solve the problem in its entirety. So, so network reliability is kind of a fallacy in a sense. So this is an example, right? Uh, by the way, I was there when this thing happened, <laughs> working on my startup, and we didn't know what was going on back then. So this news uh, snippet was cut uh, from um, Eric Brewer's presentation to the Association for Computing Machinery, also known as ACM, in uh, July of this year. So one of the things he, he quoted was actually on this particular day. It suffered unavailability for 12 hours. I was there, I lost a lot of data, and again, uh, management was very worried because it, Amazon continued to charge us, but subsequently gave us a discount. So, um, so one of the things is that, uh, so this basically, this sort of highlights the, the fact that when there's actually a network failure, sometimes even the big car vendors, the time to recover sometimes can be a bit slower. Okay? So, next thing is the network is secure, right? 
that's the kind of fallacy I love to live with. <laughs> because it's one of those problems I don't want to deal with. Uh, frankly, because um, people have this idea that the network is secure. You go on your mobile phone, your internet, right? iPhone now does it better. It will tell you that if you try to log on to a uh, less secure network, you're going to leak information. They actually tell you that. Still, they tap the information anyway. But uh, they still tell you that, <laughs> that they, um, you know, they still collect information, uh, stuff like this, and, and people, uh, people assume that they're always the network is secure. However, it's not true. So HP Labs last year released a cost of cyber crime study. So that was in 2013. So, oh, sorry. So, so, so this graph, right, highlights a few things. It basically says the amount of IT spending across the OSIs, uh, across the, the several layers that's being identified here. You'll notice that uh, the network layer takes up 40% of their annual budget. This is pretty significant. So when, so when you're starting to design uh, distributed systems, right, either it's, it's a pet project of yours on the weekend, of course, you can obviously ignore this thing. It's not going to cost you 40% of your budget per year. But when you start taking your prototypes and deploying into production systems, you need to take care of this thing. This is a real thing. It's a real threat that's costing enterprises billions of dollars. So you, you, you notice that uh, the ISO and the CMMI actually don't, don't really solve anything over here, right? So. So, in case you didn't know, the ISO and the CMMI are certification uh, uh, hierarchies that basically uh, certify your organization as good or bad. So, so the, the next thing is really one of the fallacies about this bit of computing is also the network is homogeneous. So, this thing is conjectured by James Gosling of Sun Microsystems. He's also known as the father of Java. So this thing is pretty important, right? So the network is homogeneous. How to understand it is very simple. When you, when you go onto your home network, your, your uh, entertainment system connects to your LAN. Your mobile phone connects to your LAN. Your laptop connects to your LAN. You probably have, uh, if you're like me, uh, you have a Sun machine connecting your LAN. You have a Windows, and you have a Linux, and a couple of distributions connected all over your LAN, doing some stuff, right? So the homogeneity of a network it's pretty important in this in, in, in sort of distributed uh, computing because it's, it's related to identifying your access patterns in your distributed system. Different devices obviously have different workloads, right? And different usage patterns. So this sort of is important when you are designing, uh, for example, distributed systems for social media network, for example, as per se, let's say a big data analytics platform that we're doing. So, so to give you some, some more idea, for when we are de designing a big data analytics platform with very stringent requirements on the network, first of all, obviously it needs to be, tech, uh, be dedicated. Data needs to flow at a particular speed, for example, 40 gigabit uh, uh, network, so that we can transport 400 megabytes per second across uh, at least one hop, for example. And we do not allow any other mobile, any other kind, any other kind of devices uh, with an unknown protocol to uh, leech onto the network itself. The reason is because you want to know exactly what your workload is like in the network. Okay. So the fourth fallacy is this thing idea called latency, right? Latency relates to the concept. It measures the duration that this one, this, this particular data packet, how long it takes to leave this particular point and arrive at its destination point. So uh, w again, uh, I like to assume latency is zero, but the fact is it's not, right? Now, if you think about it in a micro level, when you start to process your data at a CPU level, you're you're process you're using a few. Uh, nanoseconds of time on the CPU. Then you flush that piece of data off to your L1, L2 cache. That's another few nanoseconds. And then when the cache write back policy takes effect, that's another few nanoseconds. And then when it finally pushes onto the bus and then flows out of your NIC network card, that's already uh, probably uh, 10,000 nanoseconds or so, right? 
So once it leaves that NIC port and moves to the next destination, it is governed by only one thing, the speed of light. And that's pretty important to understand. And I find it always uh, quite interesting is, is that um, over here it says it will always take at least 13 milliseconds to send a ping from Europe to the US and back, even if the processing is done in real time. So that begs the question uh, when, for example, people say, how real time is real time? So be careful when you read brochures on, big, on websites that say, we can do real time processing. One word, bullshit. So, <laughs> <laughs> because it begs the question, how real is real time, right? So, from my perspective, there is no real time, only pseudo real time, the fits, right? It's just like uh, this, this uh, your laptop is flashing at 60 megahertz per second, right? You don't see the difference because your eyes just can't catch it that fast. Slow it down, you see it, right? And things like this. You just have to make it uh, so fast enough. So, that's the thing I will use. Ah, this is one of the fallacies I wish it was true. So, we always wish bandwidth is infinite, right? Um, this is very easy for management to manage this problem because they say, Cisco gives me a 40 gigabit network and it will run at 40 gigabit, right? And all the developers think that, oh, I have 40 gigabit uh, network. I shouldn't have any problem. So, but when you look back uh, across the other points and you try to combine them together, then you realize that, first of all, there could be a lot of devices connecting to this particular network. Second of all, latency is not zero. There are slow processors, there are slow NIC cards, there are slow whatsoever. Mixed across in a network, you have high-end performance servers, and then you have low-end, and then you have middle range, right? All these things add up to the complexity of this of this whole thing, what we call distributed computing. So, the next thing is topology doesn't change. This is not very agile, by the way. So, so topology refers to the idea that of a network topology. So, when you have a obviously when you first design your network topology, depending on what methodology that you use, you normally will design this particular uh, network that looks like something that can process your data, right? So after a while, obviously, when you launch the production, you have the next heavy problem. You have a lot of users come in and start using your system. You need to increase bandwidth. And then you say, oh, I have a 40 gigabit network. Uh, why don't we just add one or more routers to the whole system? And that sort of changes the whole topology a bit. And recently, uh, and also, you know, technical incompetency does exacerbate the problem. Uh, we had a real case recently when we actually expanded, um, we had a change of, uh, of uh, credentials in our virtual private network, and these guys actually <laughs> caused us to uh, not be able to access the internet due to some callous configuration. Okay, so, but the topology is pretty important because when the topology changes, right, it also changes the access points, right? So when you, for example, when you add a router to your particular network, it changes, it actually increases one hop for data to move, right? So it affects a lot of things that is, that is sort of going on inside your network, okay? So the seventh fallacy is that there is one administrator in your network, and you will wonder, why would this matter? So at least in my experience, I find that this fallacy to be absolutely very true, in that sense. So, when you go and manage a particular data network, right, you always assume that you're going to deliver your product to a customer that has one administrator and has a fixed network. And that one administrator supposedly knows everything there is to know about the OSGI, seven layers, and all stuff like this, right? That's what you always do. But the truth is very different. You will have normally have three or four administrators in a uh, sort of a distributed uh, network. They will be communicating. Am I doing the right thing? And then you, the other guy will say, I don't think so. The third guy will say, I think so. You see, there's this, this consensus going on. I'm right? trying to reach a consensus, and they apply the best solution at the time that was given. And sometimes this this thing can wreck the entire network and render your application or your product completely unusable, okay? 
So the last thing is transport cost is uh, zero. Uh, that's absolutely another big uh, bullshit itself. So if you have, I'm not sure, is there any finance system developers here, but you know that the managers always like to say, we should go buy InfiniBand. Because InfiniBand allows us to have a big network and, oh, sorry, my own alarm is ticking. Sorry. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> so, um, you realize that our transport cost also relates back to when you look at data processing at the micro level, starting right at the top where the chip, uh, where the CPU actually is, and how data flows out from the CPU to the register, registers up to the level uh, to the level one, two, and three caches, and then start pushing down to the bus. So, transport cost is zero. But I would say that uh, in terms of uh, how big this impact would have on your entire distributed system, probably is not that big. Uh, as compared to the rest. Okay, so so what was tried in the past? Uh, this is a personal experience. So uh, there was a um, so what was tried in the past, right? Knowing that we have this complicated uh, distributed system, and what was tried in the past? So three things. We all tried distributed objects. This is what academia gave you. So what are they? So they are practically programming constructs to hide the fact that they are local and distributed objects. And it completely ignores latency. It handles failure with this attitude. I don't know what to do. You figure it out. So an example of this programming model is the Java RMI. If you've done Java RMI, these are some of the characteristics. You build and uh, you write your Java code, you compile to an RMI interface. It doesn't care whether it's a local or a remote. Completely ignores the latency. I assume it will work in this way. When it fails, it shows an exception. doesn't tell you exactly what, what's going on. And then you have to go figure it out. And it never scales. Second thing, remote procedure call. Everybody has done it before, right? You know, in C, C++, and then you have XML RPC and stuff like this. Um, again, the RPC tries to assume the synchronous processing model, meaning I send, you receive, you acknowledge, you tell me what to do again, and I send, and so and so forth. Right? So uh, this sort of RPC is present in many things, even in C Sharp as well. So a synchronous RPC also tries to model after synchronous RPC, but it's not really that successful. So the last thing is probably, maybe a lot of people haven't heard of this. It's actually called distributed shared mutable state. Uh, the people in Sun tried to roll this thing called a Java Spaces. It sucked big time. It was just a few years ago, it sucked big time. One of the problems that was actually proven in a paper, kind of embarrassing actually, is that there is actually a danger of two independent processors to commit data at the same time. So you don't want that to happen, right? So this is pretty, pretty, uh, pretty uh, damaging to this whole concept. But uh, this thing actually came out for the market for a while, and it actually went went out pretty fast. So, so knowing this, right, I, I feel that it's very important to appreciate that distributed systems are very hard to solve in its entirety, given today's uh, technology and uh, the research and the academia that is trying to work on it. So the question is, we have one minute left. So the question is, how can we do better? We need to know two results. One of them is called the FLP impossibility result. And it basically says that in, a, in an asynchronous environment, if one processor fails, there is no distributed algorithm to solve the consensus problem. You notice that in a distributed system, right, you always need three nodes minimum, right? <coughs> And if you, if you try to mirror this into a conversation between, like, for example, let's say I committed a crime, right? I am the victim. Oh, sorry, I'm not the victim, but there will be a victim, and then there will be a policeman. There's always three parties involved. They're trying to corroborate the story. Corbor uh, corroboration of the story is really a consensus problem. You're trying to understand, to, un to, to agree on a single value. So consensus is a very fundamental um, um, topic in distributed computing, and it's, uh, it's about creating fault tolerance. So it basically boils down to the concept of whatever you say and whatever he says, are we talking about the same thing? And if we are talking about the same thing, can we uh, all agree on the same thing? 
Obviously, in management, this is very important, right? So there are two particular algorithms. Uh, the first one is in 1989, it's called a Paxos. Anybody who has done Paxos knows that it's impossible to implement. If you say in your resume, you say, I implemented Paxos, one word, bullshit. <laughs> second, thing, second thing is the Raft protocol. The Raft is developed by uh, Diego on Garo in 2013 as part of his Stanford thesis. This thing has the same power as the Paxos, and it's actually easier to understand. So I won't go into details. Uh, I actually left a list of references which you at the back of the slide so they can go read up if you like. The next thing is, uh, I'm not sure whether has anyone heard of the CAP theorem? Oh, awesome. Awesome, you guys are awesome. So the CAP theorem actually became a theorem in 2002. Uh, actually, it was originated from Dr. Eric Brewer in 2000. And it talks about three things. First, uh, sorry about the, the color and stuff. I can't see it very clearly. So it talks about three things. First is consistency. Second is availability. And the third thing is partition tolerance. So what is consistency? Consistency basically boils down to the simple idea that all the nodes in your network see the same data eventually, right? So I, I, I like to think of this as sometimes I argue with my wife and my mom-in-law in the, in the middle, and when we argue, I will sort of slowly, slowly give up while she tries to tries to convince me of the argument and my mom-in-law absolutely plays neutral this whole thing. Eventually, I agree with what she said. <laughs> so, in, in a way, this is how consistency can be thought of. The next thing is availability. Availability relates to the idea that you need the system to be still working when one or more nodes fail. Obviously, this is quite, quite important, right? So the last thing is partition tolerance. Partition tolerance talks about when a particular node in your configuration either doesn't work or there's a no network failure or there's a node failure and also arbitrary message loss. Okay? So, but how does knowing about FLP and CAP, how can it help me design better distributed systems? Right? But when you, when you read FLP and CAP, right, it's really basically about asking you this simple question. When your system fails, which one would you give up? Would you want to give up consistency? Meaning, uh, there will be some inconsistencies in the data that you read uh, in the entire system. And second is availability, obviously. Right? So do you want, can you accept the fact that uh, the system can go down and it won't be 24 by 7? So, the next thing is, uh, if you choose C or A, basically you choose consistency over availability, you need to preserve uh, reads and writes, right? So if you want to see consistent data, when something fails, what, what the industry has done, especially in, for example, the two-phase commit, is that uh, two-phase commit is very simple, right? If you have three people involved in this whole thing, you always ask somebody, are you ready to commit that data? You ask one round. If everybody say yes, you ask a second time. And if everybody say yes, then you commit the data. If, any, if somebody in that second part right, says no, you never commit the data. Because it's about leaving uh, the system in a very predictable state. So when we talk about state, we talk about data itself. right? So if you choose availability over C, the danger is that it might return you some stale reads. That means if I issue a read right now, given that system is, uh, a, a, it, it adopts this model choosing, choosing availability over consistency, I might, there's a good chance I might get a stale read. If this kind of system properties is acceptable to you, for example, uh, like for example in the Facebook update, I don't really care uh, what comes up in my timeline, seriously, in whatever order it, had, it comes up, I don't really care, I don't need to keep tabs. In that case, I can choose this particular model choosing uh, availability over consistency, right? So, here are some real-world examples I've, I've worked with in the past. So, not, not DynamoDB. DynamoDB came out from Amazon. So, Amazon uses, um, uh, produces this uh, launches paper called Dynamo, 
DB in 2007. So it basically uses vector clocks. I probably won't go into what vector clocks are. And has anybody, anybody used uh, Cassandra before? Oh, Cassandra. Very few, very few. Okay. Except Cassandra basically uses a policy called the last write means. The last process to write to, to the database will, will win. But there is a, there's a lot of uh, uh, sort of uh, negative reviews about this last write win. So Cassandra 2.0 uh, onwards actually uses a much cleverer form of uh, Cassandra to implement, uh, to basically to resolve data conflicts. Okay, the last thing you need to know about the CAP theorem is really you cannot not choose P. Partition tolerance is mandatory in the distributed system. Okay, this is one thing you have to do. When you build a distributed system, you always have to account for network failures and node failures. You can't, you can't choose this, okay? So why is this CAP um, important? Because a lot of people from Basho, people from Basho who build React, uh, microstone breaker in both DB. Uh, they all use CAP as a guiding line for them to design their systems in terms of uh, consistency, availability, and ability to tolerate partitions, which basically means failures. Now, one thing you probably want to remember, oh, we're coming very soon to the end of the presentation, is that um, to scale, you really want to partition your data. We're not talking about partition tolerance. To scale, you want to build a web scale system. You need to learn how to partition your data. You want your system to be resilient in failures. You need to understand replication, data replication. So what, what are they? So basically, this slide is, is a sort of schematic. In the partitioning, you basically split parts of your data across different nodes, right? So that you can have uh, data recovery later on if, if there is a node failure or if there's a or if there's a network failure so replication refers to the idea that you take this piece of data and then replicate it across right but this is just part one of this entire story it, it hasn't ended yet in a sense okay because um, these two strategies completely ignore time they do not tell you how data will will change will evolve over time this is where uh, the other parts of uh, distributed systems uh, makes it so, so compelling, so interesting. Okay. So, again, uh, you notice that uh, uh, I've highlighted uh, Pexels again. Uh, I'll come to that later, what the ZAD is, and then the RAP again. They are very uh, popular protocols in today, as of 2014, and it relates to replication. Replication is that definitely, it has almost a one to one. Uh, relationship with fault tolerance, which also implies on, on consensus. So consensus, again, is about reaching what you agree this value, this data to be, right? So you need to have some sort of distributed uh, communication in the first place. So ZAD, anybody has used Zookeeper before? Ah, again, very cool people. So, so the ZAD stands for Zookeeper Atomic Broadcast. Has anybody used Storm before? Okay, pretty cool. Okay, it's always the same cool people. So, um, so here's the thing, right? You, um, I'm not sure whether you are aware of this, but Storm has always been slated as a real-time analytics uh, uh, streaming engine, right? There is a reason why they call it that. It's because they actually re uh, they actually implemented this idea of a zookeeper atomic broadcast. Basically, it's about, it's a very strong consensus algorithm. Okay. So uh, I encourage you to go read up what this is and, uh, and how we can use it. Okay, the last, probably the last second slide, I think, is on consistent hashing. Consistent hashing is very interesting because it's very simple to understand and it's so effective in the real world. Consistent hashing is used in partitioning and replication and is implemented in these uh, software products that you have. Now what happens is that if you design a distributed system, you probably want to start reading up on these technologies first before you go build your own. Because these guys, uh, you know, they spend really a long time trying just to create a theory that proves and disproves something. So I think another bunch of guys already have went to implement this. So 
I'm pretty sure that a lot of people are very familiar with memcached. So memcached has this idea of consistent hashing. You notice that when, uh, when things fail, they don't really fail. They just shift over. That's where you, you get that availability from. Okay. So, okay, I guarantee you, this is the second last line. <laughs> so, um, here are some, some tips. So, before you go about this, designing your distributed system, question number one. If your problem can fit into the memory of a single machine, you don't really need a distributed system. Second, if you want to design a distributed system, the following points actually help. You, first of all, you always design for failure. You must always design for failure, right? You never, you, the, the, the mantra stands, you never ship, ship to the customers, okay? And uh, you use FLP and CAP to critique your systems. When somebody tells you on a brochure, a lot of pictures, illustrations, etc., those are just noise. Tell, ask them, how, where does it fulfill? How does it match the CAP? Is it partitioned or torrent? It, when you say availability, how, how is it being done? Is it using quorums? Or, and when it comes to consistency, what kind of consistencies, consistencies are we talking about? Is it strong consistency? Meaning, at any point in time, on the clock, the data will always stay the same for thousands of nodes, okay? That's one of the questions you want to ask, and, and things like this. And the, the last point, the, the second last point will be the uh, algorithms. Algorithms that work for a single node may not work in a distributed node, right? You know this because, uh, because at least if you look on Amazon.com, tons of people have written algorithms that run on a single node, but only probably 10 people have written algorithms on distributed uh, algorithms and stuff like that. And also avoid coordinating uh, nodes. Don't coordinate, okay? The, the, the beauty of the CAP is that it's trying to minimize uh, coordination down to the minimum, okay? And the last point, learn to estimate your capacity. Jeff Dean from Google in 2009 released this table of stuff. This is highly recommended. You probably need to uh, memorize this. So <laughs> it basically talks about Data, when it leaves the CPU, what happens? What kind of latencies are we talking about? As it leaves the CPU, goes into a branch mispredict, L2 cache reference, mutex logs, and, and things like this. And by the time, the last point is pretty important, when it basically leaves the NIC, um, when it leaves California, goes to the Netherlands, and comes back to the California. And I leave you this with the uh, references, uh, which you can go read up. And um, I believe that is the end. Thank you.